Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks very much to Stephen Shore and the entire team at Real Truth for organizing what has to be an unprecedented uh, conference and delighted to be with you here again. Um, so as uh, Michael indicated, I'm gonna talk to you about why, uh, ask the question, why do I have Parkinson's disease? And you might ask, why is that an important question to ask? And I'll give you three reasons. One, uh, if you have Parkinson's disease, you probably want a cure for that disease. And I can't think of any disease that we can cure medically where we don't know the cause. I'll say that again. I can't think of any disease uh, where we can cure it when we don't know its cause, at least cure it medically. Second reason is if you have Parkinson's disease, yeah, you might wanna slow the rate of progression of the disease. And if you know what the cause is, you can avoid those uh, uh, causal factors and likely slow the progression of the disease. The analogy I like to use is if you've been diagnosed with lung cancer, what's the first thing the doctor is going to tell you to do? And that's likely to stop smoking. And third, and perhaps most importantly, um, if we can answer what causes the disease, we can prevent uh, people from ever getting it. So about 1.2 million Americans have Parkinson's disease today, but that says 320 some million people don't have it. And they probably don't want to have a disease that in the words of Michael J. Fox sucks. Um, so uh, we need to figure out what uh, is causing the disease so we can develop more effective treatments for it, so we can slow its disease progression, and so we can prevent uh, millions of Americans in this currently and future generations from ever developing the disease. Uh, the same question should be asked of any disease. So you should ask your clinicians, why do I have colon cancer or breast cancer or diabetes? Because once you start asking those questions, we get closer to getting to treatments, we get to closer to slowing the rate of progression of the disease, and we get closer to a world where these diseases can be increasingly rare as opposed to increasingly common. So I'm gonna to talk to you about three things. One, uh, the rise of Parkinson's disease, which is now the world's fastest growing brain disease. Second, argue to you that Parkinson's disease is largely a man-made disease, a disease of our own making, uh, and thus, uh, because of the diseases principally of our own making, uh, we can largely prevent and end this disease. Um, so first, uh, the rise of Parkinson's disease. So the first major description of a Parkinson's disease was uh, by a doctor named Dr. James Parkinson, who was a 61-year-old physician, uh, surgeon actually, in London when he saw something new on the streets of the city. Um, he described six individuals, uh, three of whom uh, he just observed walking the streets with what he said it was a disease that had not been classified in the medical literature, a new disease, a rare disease, a disease that's characterized by a stooped posture, a shuffling gait, and a tremor. And he went to great lengths to uh, highlight that tremor has long been around and described in the medical literature, but this constellation of symptoms was something new. And what's going on in London in 1817? Well, uh, England's the, it's the height of the Industrial Revolution and London's the capital. And the streets of London are polluted. Um, and you can see from this picture, it looks like modern day Beijing where uh, a wife, uh, a woman and her husband and their child are all covering their mouths from the toxic effects of the air pollution, which is so dense and so uh, dirty that they can barely see across the street. And since that time, since Dr. Parkinson described the condition affecting six people in 1817, 200 years later, the Global Burden of Disease Study estimated that 6 million people had the disease. And so how do you go from a disease affecting six people to 6 million in just 200 years? It can't be genetics and it's going far faster than can be explained by aging alone. And if we don't change the course of the, the disease, the number of people with Parkinson's disease globally is projected to double in the coming generation. And if you look at the map of uh, Parkinson's disease, um, you'll notice something that's really important, uh, that the rates of the disease vary by a factor of five. The areas of the world that are most industrialized, like the United States and Canada, have the highest rates of the disease. Areas of the world that are least industrialized, like Sub-Saharan Africa in blue, have the lowest rates of the disease. And areas of the world that are undergoing the most rapid industrialization, like India and China, have the fastest increasing rates of the disease. China, for example, has seen its rates of Parkinson's disease adjusted for aging more than double in just the last 25 years. 
So that's the rise of Parkinson's disease. Well, what's causing this rise? Um, and I think this disease is largely man-made. And what do I mean by man-made? Um, I'll give you a classic example, and that's lung cancer. If you look at this graph uh, and you look at lung cancer deaths in the United States in black, and you go out to about 1900, you'll reach the conclusion that lung cancer in the United States just over 100 years ago largely did not exist. Lung cancer, the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States in 1900, just about didn't exist. It was so rare that when doctors encountered, encountered a case, they gather around all their colleagues and, and uh, trainees and bring them around uh, thinking that they would never see it again. They considered it a once in a lifetime oddity. Unfortunately, they were wrong. Uh, 25 years after the introduction of cigarettes into the United States in about 1900, you see a corresponding rise in lung cancer deaths. And one of the great public health achievements of the last 50 years has been a decrease in smoking. And you can see 25 years after we stopped smoking cigarettes, um, we've seen a decline in the number of lung cancer deaths. So think about lung cancer as a classic example of a man-made disease or many others, everything from car accidents to likely large portions of type two diabetes uh, and the like. Um, and I'm gonna make the argument that Parkinson's disease, is, uh, much of it is largely man-made. And why do I say that? Uh, because the heritability, the genetic contributions of, to Parkinson's disease are relatively low. Um, this is a figure from a page, paper from Nature Review Genetics and my uh, uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Boss Bloom, uh, put it in order from most heritable conditions such as type one diabetes and schizophrenia to the least heritable conditions, including Parkinson's disease and breast cancer. And even just a note on breast cancer, many have heard about the mu cancer mutations BRCA1 and BRCA2, and they are indeed important causes of breast cancer, but they only account for 10% of people with breast cancer. 90% of women who have breast cancer have it for reasons that have nothing to do with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And while there are some genetic causes of Parkinson's disease that I'm gonna show you in a, in a moment, the vast majority of Parkinson's disease is driven by environmental factors. And so these are the genetic causes of Parkinson's disease. A few notes on some of them, uh, one, for most of them, if you inherit a genetic mutation in these genes, your risk of Parkinson's disease is much higher, but for most of them, it's less than 100%. Um, so for example, LARP2, which is uh, the most common inherited form of uh, Parkinson's disease, your lifetime risk of developing the disease is only about 30 or 40%. Said another way, the majority of people with that mutation, the most common genetic cause of Parkinson's disease, do not develop the disease. Second, you'll see that these conditions are rare. Um, these mutations are, I'm sorry, are rare. And so if you total up, it's only about 15% of people with Parkinson's disease have an uh, identifiable genetic risk factor for the disease. And third, you'll notice that almost all these genetic risk factors have a known in interaction with the environment. So this interaction between genes and the environment likely explains those who are exposed to, exposed to different environmental factors, which ones of those individuals will go on to develop the disease. So what are the gen environmental causes of Parkinson's disease? Now I'm gonna posit that there are three major environmental causes of Parkinson's disease, at least in the United States. Those three causes are one, air pollution, two, certain pesticides, especially pesticide called Paraquat, and three, a dry cleaning chemical called trichloroethylene or TCE. Uh, so first, air pollution. Um, there's, in, there's increasing evidence that links air pollution that in, our, in our atmosphere uh, to Parkinson's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death uh, in the United States globally. It costs each of us about three years of life expectancy. Each human in the United States life expectancy on average is reduced three years because of air pollution. And 95% of the world lives in, in, in areas that have air pollution above uh, those deemed to be safe by the World Health Organization. Second are pesticides. The poster child for the pesticide that's linked to Parkinson's disease is a pesticide called Paraquat. Um, it's considered the most toxic herbicide or weed killer ever created. It kills the weeds that Roundup can't. It's associated with 150% increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Its use in the United States has actually doubled over the last um, 
uh, over the last five years. The EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's own website, says one sip can kill, but it's still a permitted. And the last one is this chemical. It's called trichloroethylene. It's the chemical that's contaminated the marine-based Camp Lejeune. Was widely used in uh, dry cleaners until it was uh, replaced by a very similar chemical called perchloroethylene or PCE. TCE is a very simple chemical. It's got six atoms, two carbon atoms, one hydrogen, and three chlorine atoms, hence its name trichloroethylene. Um, it's associated with a 500% increased risk of Parkinson's disease, according to one twin study. It's known to cause cancer in thousands of sites, including in Silicon Valley. Southern California, Rochester, New York, where I'm sitting today, and probably uh, near where you live are contaminated with this chemical. And global use of this chemical is increasing at 3% per year. I'm gonna walk you through the evidence for each one of these. So first, air pollution. So we highlighted that Dr. Parkinson was describing the condition uh, which later came to bear his name, Parkinson disease in London in 1817. So what was the air pollution like in London in 1800? Well, many of you watched the TV series, The Crown, and many of you saw the Great Smog of 1952, um, which killed uh, an estimated 12,000 individuals in London, led to mass hospitalizations, and actually led to the first Clean, Health, Clean, Air, uh, Clean Air Act uh, about four years later. Air uh, pollution in 1800 London was twice as bad as it was in 1952. Uh, so you can see that the levels of particulate matter, those little pieces of dirt and soot uh, that you can see in smog in Los Angeles, for example, the levels of that were twice as high as in 1800 as they were in the 1950s and 20 times higher than they are today. In essence, people in 1800 L London were breathing the air that we that people in Delhi, India, uh, one of the most polluted countries uh, and the, one of the most polluted cities in the world are breathing uh, today. And it, in addition, if you look at the map of where air pollution first began, it first began in Europe and then it came into the Americas and then to Asia. And to date, fortunately, it's been relatively low in Africa. And if you look at the map of Parkinson's disease, you first see it rising in Europe, then coming to the Americas, then increasing most rapidly in Asia and historically having the lowest rates of uh, Parkinson's disease in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's the story about air pollution, um, which by the way, is better in the United States now than it was, for example, in the 1970s. So we're making some headway, at least in the United States in addressing air pollution, but we have much more room uh, uh, to go. Second class of uh, environmental factors that's linked to Parkinson's disease and likely fueling it are certain pesticides. So this is a map of paraquat use in the United States. And so you can see it covers um, the United States. Just about every state in the United States is still using paraquat. It's a beautiful spring day here in Rochester, New York, and uh, paraquat is likely being sprayed onto fields uh, as I speak. Um, paraquat, as I mentioned earlier, is associated with 150% increased risk of uh, Parkinson's disease. When you feed paraquat to laboratory animals, it reproduces the clinical and pathological features of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's so toxic that one sip can kill, as the EPA indicated. It's been used to commit homicide and suicide. And over 30 countries, including China, have banned the chemical, but the United States has not. I'll say that again. The United States still permits and is increasingly using a pesticide that other countries, including China, have not, that China have banned. And in October of last year, The Guardian, a British investigative uh, newspaper, wrote an expose on, the gar on Paraquat. The headline was, Secret Files Suggest Chemical Giant Feed the Weed Killers Link to Parkinson's Disease. And as I'm going to show you, based on that reporting, they knew about its risks of Parkinson's disease and its link to Parkinson's disease for the last 50 years and tried to cover it up and did cover it up. And uh, this... Subtitle says that documents seen by the Guardian detail an effort to refute scientific research um, into paraquat and derail the nomination of an advisor for the Environmental Protection Agency. And that uh, EPA, that scientist that they tried to refute was my colleague, Deborah Corey Schlechta, who actually just works right across the street from where I'm sitting right now. And they said that her research, a woman, 
said that they said that her research was overly dogmatic. If that sounds like familiar uh, terms to be using to a woman that's seeking to change the world, uh, it's exactly right. And so what did the uh, reporters for The Guardian find out? Well, they found out that in 1955, the company introduced Paraquat as a weed killer. So this chemical has been around for almost 70 years. First introduced into England and the United States in the early 60s. In the 1966, company scientists, so these are the own company's researchers, according to The Guardian, find that large doses of Paraquat in some rats and mice result in a stiff gait or tremors. That's basically a description of uh, Parkinson's disease. In 1974, shortly after I was born, regulators are concerned about workers who, quote, might inadvertently lick small quantities of paraquat residue off their lips or inhale paraquat misc, mist. Rumors circulate almost 50 years ago that some of the EPA favor banning paraquat. Two years later, an autopsy of farm workers working with uh, paraquat showed degenerative changes in the cells of the substantia nigra. These are exactly the nerve cells that we know are damaged in Parkinson's disease. In 1985, a company memo reports about a scientific article that's showing an extraordinarily high correlation of 0.967. A perfect correlation is one. So 0.967 is nearly a perfect correlation between levels of pesticide use and Parkinson's cases. The memo warns that paraquat could become a huge li legal liability like as asbestos and says that Parkinson's can go on for decades. And they're exactly right. <laughs> so I shared this uh, information with my uh, colleague, Professor Amit Ray, who's an English professor at, at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And he introduced me to a new word called agnotology. Never heard of this word before. It was coined in 1962 by a linguist. And agnotology is the deliberate production of ignorance, often for commercial gain. The deliberate prediction of production of ignorance, not knowledge, ignorance, often for commercial gain. And the poster child for agnotology are tobacco manufacturers, which systematically sought to cover up, disclose, obfuscate, plant seeds of doubt, uh, about the health risks that they knew were linked uh, to their products. In fact, they adopted a slogan of doubt is our product to conceal the health risks of smoking. And the same thing is being applied to paraquat. And if it's being applied to a, one pesticide that's being linked to Parkinson's disease, we should ask about what other chemicals is this being applied to that are linked to Parkinson's disease? And what other chemicals is this being applied to that are linked to a wide range of other diseases? Agnotology. <laughs> 